You know, I want to I want to tell you, you do that to me way too often. <laughs> I think he does it on purpose. I was going to do my radio voice and say, Welcome to Money and Motivation with Nancy Fleming and co-host Mark Windsor. Excellent, Mark. <laughs> See, I thought, but he messed up my... On. I but thought, he, he pulled the switch on but my But I mic. thought Nancy was going to do that. That's so I was like, mm, all right. Oh I'll remember. I'll make a note of that. Oh just my. switching it up a little bit. All right. All right. And special Wouldn't guest with us tonight. Nancy, I'll let you at least yes, introduce your guest. Yes, my special guest is Susan Carlson. She is a regional representative for a number of long-term care insurance companies, and we are going to talk tonight about how we get to the money if, in case we need it. Welcome, Susan. Thank you, Nancy. Glad to be here. Yes, and you've been involved with this for how long? Oh, over 20 years now. 20 years. So people have been getting old for that long. Yes, That's what you're trying have. to say? Okay. <laughs> Including myself. Including yourself. We don't <laughs> count ourselves. Do we, Mark? I count myself. I am proud to be over 50, man. Are you? 51 and loving it. Good for you. One of those baby boomers, huh? Yeah, baby barely. I'm on the edge. Of, I think them. I'm on the edge within a couple of years of the edge of baby boomers, actually. Are you? Well, that still puts you in. Yeah. That big group. So when we talk about getting older, what's one, you know, one of the big things that happens with getting older is what? That we need care for an extended period of time. Well, getting out of bed gets harder, I can tell you that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have to, I was out of town this weekend. I played kickball. With the red rubber so ball? Are you sore? Not at all. I was actually quite impressed. <laughs> but I do work out at the gym so I can keep out. So, you know, I'm not 10. 10 years so I mentioned that my gym. son is doing all of his senior projects and all yes. that kind of stuff. And so one of, the, one of the things he's doing is a video mirage or whatever you call those of his life right right and he, he wanted we we have done karate together so he wanted to film him and me sparring that that was an interesting oh, thing on be. my 51 year old body mm -hmm. yes he won <laughs> so based on how you feel at 51 what are your projections for when 75 rolls around oh i'm going to be in much better shape i've decided i'm going to start drinking this juice that joe bought for me <laughs> um I'll spar with my son more often Right, and there's a lot of people working on getting healthier. However, we do have something against us, which is called the normal aging process. So how does that work a little bit, Susan? What kinds of things do we see people unfortunately getting, whether they're looking forward to it or not? Well, a lot of time it's just the, the natural breakdown of the body. So what used to be easier for us when we were younger just takes a lot more effort. Um, I, for instance, am a little bit older and have a five-year-old. And just what it does to me physically versus somebody that's in their young 20s that has a child, is it's just like night and day. So regardless of all the medical advances that are happening, it's still not going to improve. It might lengthen our, our um, how long that we live, but it doesn't always necessarily improve how we live. And it's, it's just a part, a part of life, just the natural aging process. So we may live longer, but not necessarily better. Correct. Is what we're looking at. So what, again, so what conditions do people generally get that cause them to become, and I know the word I've read before is frail. A person becomes generally more frail first. Can you tell us about how that works? Uh, it could be things, um, Parkinson's, MS, uh, someone, um, like what runs in my family is the dementia, the Alzheimer's, which is the most devastating type of, of condition that will happen as you become older. But it could just be different types of, of diagnoses where, again, physically, we're just not able to do what we used to be doing. Okay. And, and I can't remember if dementia runs in my family. Yeah, I can't remember <laughs> that either. <That's> <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to keep that mic, though, in front of you in front of you more. So pull that closer so okay. they can hear you with your wonderful young lady voice. All right. Yeah, right. So when we end up needing more help, that generally when we use the word need in front of anything, it generally turns into money after the fact. Have you noticed that? I need whatever, and it usually follows that the need costs something. And so when we're dealing with the normal aging process, part of what we see is that we're, first of all, visiting the doctor more, or to stay healthy, we're buying more juice, aren't we, Mark? And we're buying more vitamins, trying to beat it up. I mean, I know I take a lot more vitamins today than I when I was 25, and the idea being that, yeah, you, you want to be able to stay as healthy as and for as long as possible. So we need extra help eventually. Correct. And so what kinds of costs are we looking at? What kinds of care is available? What are the costs with those care? What do we see going on there? Well, the, the cost really, uh, there's such a huge variety because a lot of it, we can't capture it because 
Most of the assistance that first happens during the normal aging is provided by a family or a loved one, and there's no way to really put a dollar amount around that because it's not so much just the physical that this individual is having to help with, but if, if they're working, how is that going to affect their job? If they have uh, children of their own, how is that going to affect their children? Uh, retirement savings, so there's a whole nother layer to the, to the numbers that we see. But the numbers that we can um, look at and capture are those that are provided by licensed care agencies, whether it be a home care agency, an assisted living facility, or a nursing home. And we could be look as high, looking at as high as almost ninety to $100,000 a year if I wanted to go into an above average nursing home. Home care can also be very expensive, especially if I have somebody that I need more than eight hours a day. Maybe I want to stay at home and I have the means to pay for that, so I actually would hire somebody to come live with me. So I would have a 24-hour caretaker, and in that instance, we could be looking at $300, $400 a day. So it, there is just a huge range of expenses and costs. To me, what's more important, though, and what is more devastating is not always necessarily is the money cost, is the emotional, what it does to the family and how it affects the caretaker and also the siblings and, and the children as well. And so what I heard you saying is that there's times when adult children or maybe even grandchildren will either leave their jobs or they will not accept promotions. Correct in order to take care of a family member. So how, do, what kind of statistics do we have on that? What are we looking at there? Well, it's, I, I could give more of examples than I can on statistics, but. Okay, examples would be good. Okay, if looking at, at, in my case, the Alzheimer's runs on my mom's side. So initially, I'm absolutely gonna start helping my mom, and of course, that's going to affect the hours that I'm able to work. It's kind of like when you have a young child, you know, and, um, Promotions, um, just like you said, lost productivity, having to leave in the middle of the day for doctor's visits or just emergency calls, different types yeah. of events that are going to take away from my productivity at work. And it really affects women much more than it does men. So it's my career that's really going to have a damper on how I'm able to, to move forward, both monetarily and also professionally, if I'm taking care of my parents but I don't have a choice because you know, what else am I going to do? Alzheimer's is one of the hardest diseases, really. We, we have a neighbor. Her mother just recently passed away, okay. but she was, she was caring for her mom, and her mom was starting to have Alzheimer's. And uh, just a few weeks ago, we got a call. Uh, no, what was oh, I was working in my yard a little bit, and a neighbor stopped by and says, Hey, there's, you're connected to the neighborhood. There's a woman, just an old woman, just wandering around. My wife and I quickly dart around the corner, and sure enough, it's this woman's mother. Just and it's, the sheriff had already been called, so he was showing, oh, you know, man. Debbie was showing up, and so then she's, as you mentioned, <clears throat> with her career, you know, then she's having to leave her work to figure out what to do with it. And yeah, it's tough. It's a tough, tough disease. Absolutely, and and it's a it's a situation where we don't have choices. It's something that I'm going to be put into what's what's going to affect my life, and then how's that going to affect my daughters? You know, well, and, and I know that, that that particular illness is pretty bad. I, you know, years ago, I have clients who passed away, so I can kind of use their story a little bit. And when the wife had Alzheimer's, and it could be dementia, you don't really know till after the fact, but the loss of reason, and she was cold, and her husband walked in to find her making a pile of wood in the living room to okay. start a fire mm -hmm. to be warm. And that situation, you know, we, we want to keep our family members home as long as possible. <sighs> But when they begin to be a danger to us or a danger to themselves, and the wandering's a big thing. I know I've had a couple of retired people tell me that they were out taking a walk and were stopped by people, well-meaning, who just said, do you know where you are? Okay. Just to be sure. Oh, I have just that to, to sure. look forward to, huh? <laughs> you do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> well, especially if, if, you know, one was using a, a, like a cane and walking slowly. And so, but it was well-meaning because we do. If you live in an area where there are a lot of retirees, or even if you don't and you see someone that's walking slowly, mm -hmm. your first thought would be, do they need help? Do right. they know where they are? Right. Is this on purpose or by accident? And I think we see enough of this on the news with these stories that people are taking the extra step mm -hmm. to reach out to make sure you are okay. Right. So, so we've got. Um, how does a what kind of condition does a person have to be in in order for some type of? Well, first of all, tell us what long-term care policies do, and then we'll talk about how 
And, and why would people want them? People don't like insurance companies very much, so why would they embrace right. another one? Right. The, the, way that I inv or the way that I view long-term care insurance is more like your long-term health care. We all have some type of short-term health care policy, whether it be our HMOs, our PPOs, Medicare, or whatever other type of product we have. But those policies are designed to cover an illness which is short-term in which you're going to be getting better. A lot of times with the normal aging process, that is not the case, that we are not going to be getting better, and this is going to last over 90 days, so your health insurance does not pick up those costs. So this is more what we might call a chronic condition. So Absolutely. a person has a stroke, they recover from the stroke, but they're left with the residuals of a Correct. stroke. Maybe they don't walk as well or there's, their arm doesn't move as well or something like that. Right, so these policies are designed to cover those additional medical expenses or just the additional cost of care to help the person remain living independently or just to help them maintain their lifestyle. And the way that they're designed now is they really cover the entire gamut. They'll cover whether or not you're receiving services or care at home, which most of us want to do. In fact, when you look at the statistics, 80% of all claims on a long-term care insurance policy are at home. Then, of course, they have the new assisted living facilities, which are wonderful because you still can have an independent living, but yet you live as a community. And then if you need to go into a nursing home as a last resort, or if you're going there maybe to recover from a hospital stay, these policies will cover services there as well. So they provide you freedom of choice because you can decide where it is that you want to remain and where you would like to have care. Thank you. Well, and it's been my understanding, because I read some of these statistics, that when insurance companies first started with these long-term care policies, they did it in response to changes in Medicare, and they really had no statistics. Exactly. It's, it's a brand new product. There's not a lot of history. So the way that they initially designed these was following how Medicare covers. And Medicare, there's quite a few, uh, um, uh, uh, what would I call them, blocks or, or things that you need to jump over in order to receive any benefits from your Medicare policy for long-term care. Well, what are some of the ways? Because a lot of people I talk to just assume because they have Medicare, well, or their parents have Medicare. Well, Medicare, they're just right. going to pay for everything. Isn't that what they do? But you're saying now that that's not necessarily true. Absolutely. You have to have a, a, an entire three-day hospital stay. So when I think of my grandmother who had Alzheimer's, she didn't spend three days in a hospital. Medicare would cover nothing. And you probably the biggest catch, in my view, is that you have to be showing progress, that you're getting better. So if I have a stroke in which I'm paralyzed and I'm not able to get in and out of the bathtub or do some of the things of my own and I'm not showing improvement, Medicare is going to cover nothing. So overall, Medicare covers around 18% of long-term care costs. And how long will they cover the cost? How long can a person be in the facility that Medicare would cover if they met all of the Medicare's qualifications? The longest would be 100 days. Because isn't Medicare designed to be an acute care plan? We've yes. all, I've always thought it was Medicare, and this might make you feel good, Mark, when you get to that age. <laughs> Medicare is designed to keep you alive, and they've done a great job. Since right. Medicare's inception, the life expectancy has been climbing and climbing and climbing. But once they do their job of keeping you alive, they're not uh, responsible for the quality of life. In fact, you reminded me of a story a number of years ago. I had a lady, and for some reason, she was taking her garbage can out and turned around and ran into her garage door. Now, okay. we all do really silly things. However, the resulting fall caused her to break her pelvis. And when she went to the hospital, this is a true story, they would not admit her because there's nothing they could do for a broken pelvis. <laughs> So they sent her home and said, go lay down, go home and lay down, your okay. pelvis will heal. So, of course, she checked herself in to, you know, an assisted living, some type of facility to just lay there until it got better, and then she went home and finished laying around until it got better. But at the time, I was astounded. I'm thinking, really, you can fall and break a pelvis, and Medicare offers not one single cent. Right. I, I mean, is that the kind of thing you're seeing? Is that what you're talking about? We're Absolutely. And we're also seeing, though, it's just the false expectation that Medicare will cover 
the, the, the cost when, in fact, they won't. So, and even what's going on today with all the cutbacks in Medicare, that's really having nothing to do with long-term care, is it? No, and if anything, it's going to cut back what little Medicare will pay. Right, because they were never, Medicare is never designed to pay long-term care anyway. Correct. All right, mm-hmm. so we're looking at, at the long-term care issue today. That's one thing we cannot say, oh, say anything about because it's been that way forever. Right, oh, right. Okay. Okay, so I thought we had a call. I was paying it. Okay. <laughs> and so um, so then if we look at a person who, let's suppose they, oh, and the other thing is my understanding, now correct me if I'm wrong here, so, le- so let's suppose, because I had this happen a few years ago, I had a client who had been in a care home for Alzheimer's, and then they had something happen where they had a physical condition, their kidneys gave out or something, so they were in the hospital, then they went back to the care facility. Mm-hmm. But... There, um, but they weren't able to continue to get payment because they needed to be in the nursing home for the Alzheimer's, not in the nursing home for what they were in the hospital for. Okay. So how does that work? Well, so, I mean, they were in the hospital. They covered their three days and three nights, and they went back into the, the facility. So what happened there? There, it was probably that they were not showing progress. You have to show progress that you are getting better. And, and, and if they were initially, and also for the, for the Alzheimer's, that a lot of times I don't need actual licensed care or medical services for that. Mm-hmm. I need someone to help watch over me, make sure for my safety. So that would be nothing that Medicare would would cover. Right, and but um, it was my understanding at the time that they were not in the care facility for the same thing they were in the hospital for. Oh, so doesn't I, your yes. care have to be for the same thing you're in the hospital yes. for? So yes. if you have two or three things wrong, and one of them makes you need care, but it's not the same thing you're in the hospital for, then Medicare does not have any responsibility Correct. there also. Correct. So if we look at Medicare, they're playing doctors, right. they're paying hospitals, and again, they're designed to keep people alive. So if I have that stroke or I fall and break my hip, I go into the rehab. Mm-hmm. They're not using nursing homes anymore. In my area, they're called specialty hospitals okay. or rehab. Oh, okay. We don't have nursing homes anymore where I live. <laughs> I want you to know this. Not any I can think of anyway. They've all because that's such a bad name. It is. I mean, it when is. I Nurse, you, nursing homes a bad name. When I was yeah, because everybody thinks about the White House on the corner. Yeah. I was a little girl. We I was in brownies. I remember there was the old folks home on the corner this big white house and i still remember going there and the nice old man that taught me how to weave baskets true story so that's what people i think think of nursing homes is this you know the old white house on the corner and that's where the old <clears throat> folks are sort of stowed for the right. time being and then you go there when you want to you know do feel good community service projects and i do very nice man i wove three baskets he showed me how <laughs> well betty from tempe called in and wanted to know is there a resource that that Betty can go to to locate a she she said nursing home. See, I didn't think that was a bad word. Um, do you know of any service that's available or anywhere online, or can they contact you? Or you know, I think if 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 she, if Betty wouldn't mind reaching out to Nancy because there are there are resources, and it, there is one carrier called Care Scout who actually does. Uh, reporting and and will have some information about the different facilities and there's also what's called local care coordinators which are individuals who specialize in setting up care so they know uh, and and they're also better when it comes to referrals because they've heard you know who uh, provides good care who doesn't so much Um, but I think it would be terrific to reach out to Nancy so I can get that information to you oh that'd be fine also the East Valley Adult Resources, which is the new name for the East Valley Senior Centers, (laughs) but they're the East Valley Adult Resources. If you called over there, and I know there is a a Tempe Center. that Again, they used to be called Senior Centers, and a lot of them are changing their names. But I know that the larger one is the East Valley, and they will have uh, community liaisons and community coordinators where you could call over there, and they will be able to give you books. I know I have a couple of books that I picked up from them (coughs) that talk about community resources. And depending upon what you're looking for, assisted living, facilities um, are the big ones where you're dealing with apartment complexes, which mm-hmm. is what we think about, the ones that you know make you feel really special. You have the great dining rooms and the ice cream parlors and they come to your hair. You can usually find those listed, but we have small 
care homes that take only 10 people. And those are very – because we remember we had one, a lady on the show here six or eight weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And those, you they don't advertise for a lot of time. Not at They're, all. Not at all. They're word of mouth. Okay. And so you often, if you're going to look for the equivalent of a nursing home and go to the 10-person care home, which in Arizona are licensed as assisted living, that is word of mouth. And you would – contact some of the these other outreach people who know about them and just hook into the network of the word of mouth of who knows who knows and who knows and yeah and there i could get people hooked into some of those those word of mouth places terrific mm-hmm. so but yeah it's hard to know some will advertise but you do again you've got these community resource books that are really helpful i would think that the uh the 10 person ones um are are much more in demand versus the type like friendship village where there's a ton of people i mean you, wouldn't you have much more personal care at those i think so have you visited some of them i have visited because of i've had people in them over the years right so right. what now what do you think now do now if we go back to the insurance policies are they paying for these if the uh the uh, residential home is licensed with the state of arizona so it follows the regulations then yes most policies will however you always need to fall back to make sure that you read your contractual language because some of the older policies might not because they might not have existed at -hmm. that time. So it's absolutely good to, 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 if you have an existing policy, but a lot of the new plans do. And I think a lot of it also goes on the family and what the person is looking for. Someone um, like my mom would probably prefer more of an apartment type living for the for the um, interaction and but somebody that needs a little bit more one-on-one more care i would feel more comfortable putting them in a residential home than a nursing home and it also comes down to cost you know what is it that that person can afford right okay so we've got as long as they're licensed they can go just about anywhere now let's go back for a minute we talked about 80 percent of the people are at home and you also said a lot of the caregivers might be family members now does that mean the insurance is useless? So some, so mom or dad takes out their insurance, but then it ends up that their daughter or granddaughter mm-hmm. wants to take care of them. Does, do, are they just out? No, because traditionally what happens is the family steps in, but you're going to need help. So by having the long-term care policy that my mother has, it's going to help me take care of my mom even better. So it's going to build a nice foundation. So when I need to live my own life, go to work, I can hire somebody to come in and step in. My fear is, though, that there are many policies that go unused because the children do not know that they have that resource. But if you look at the the traditional uh, care continuum, starts with the family then you're going to need to start bringing somebody in and then they would start to use their policy so they kind of hold on to it till they need to start bringing in services much more frequently so there's it seems like there's a couple of ways to go so you could have uh, and i've known of people where they've had their parent in the home and they have had care come in while they're at work much like daycare for a child right or we also have adult daycare out in the community again there's in various places or it sounds like, let's suppose the daughter does need to leave her job. Now, aren't there some out there that will pay, once you show them you're disabled, they'll just pay so much each month, regardless, and then you don't have to have a, a hire a paid home care agency? Most of your insurance companies now work on more of a reimbursement scenario, so like your health insurance, where you technically would incur the cost first, then submit the bills to show that this is licensed care, and then the insurance company would reimburse either you or you could assign your benefits. There are a few carriers, however, that will just pay if once you are eligible for claim, they would pay you a monthly amount at the beginning of the month and you can do whatever it is that you would like to. So if that will help offset some of your spouse's expenses, you could do that. But a majority of your policies are more of a reimbursement for licensed type of care. So my thought is, if we go, let's suppose we have a situation where we have several children, and of the several children, generally only one is going to be willing to do the care. And so, and of course, the other children are expecting when when the parent dies, even though they haven't helped out at all, the inheritance will all be the same. Right. So we, so how do we have mom or dad handle the situation? Would it be advisable then? It sounds like it might be advisable if they were to take a plan that would pay each month. They could compensate the caregiving child for the caregiving 
without invading the estate so all the kids could still get the same thing. Not that that's right or wrong. No, I'm not making a value judgment on, on on any of that, but I'm just saying it's it seems like the right kind of policy to provide money for the caregiving child so that they're not, in a sense, treated unfairly for the amount of hours that they're contributing. Yes, that's so they could, that would work. Doesn't yes. all this need to be done in a living trust or something like that? You are sounding so professional, Joe. I am so impressed. Aren't you impressed, Mark? I yes. learned it all from your show, <laughs> Nancy. No, you doesn't, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> Our long-term care is, is, a, is a separate issue from the living trust, and so um, we don't have the living trust doesn't own the long-term care policies. And um, but Thanks for the plug, I must say. Yes, yes. <laughs> Trusts are <laughs> vital for many people in their estate planning. Right now we're trying to – we're – working to save the assets that are in the trust because once we have the disabled adult it's going to cost money yes. and the show's about how to get to the money so we're saying here the disabled parent in this example has a family member willing to take care of them so we have four children the other three don't want their inheritance in any way shape or form to be uh, affected by the by the parent's illness mm -hmm. also not willing to help take care of the parent and in fact will criticize the caregiver yes. this is very common yes. and so we're trying to figure out a way to preserve the trust assets in this scenario so the question is we can then take a long-term care policy that provides money that's not trust assets to compensate to the very kind child who has loyalty to the parents willing to take care of them and we're starting to see more children contribute towards that premium Especially oh, if they point. live, you know, across the United States where each of them maybe contributes $50 a month towards that long-term care premium to make sure that their parents will receive the best of care. Um, I, for an instance, I pay my parents' entire long-term care insurance premiums because I'm the person that, that's going to take care of my parents because that's what families do. You know, do you have siblings? I do, and I'm still waiting for her contribution. Oh, one sibling. Yes. Is she? So if you're listening tonight. Yes, Stephanie. <laughs> yes, Stephanie. Yes, send that check. But um, it was more of a, of a selfish type of buy because long-term care, when it happens, it doesn't really affect that person. It affects the family and everybody surrounding that person. So by having this policy, it provides me peace of mind as a daughter that I will be able to make sure that my mom and dad have the best care that money can buy. <clears throat> and that's worth all the money. In the well, world. I have a couple of questions. First of all, it, it, is there a point where it becomes too late to get the insurance? And the second question is, how, how many proportionately, you know, percentage-wise, how many are have such policies? Okay. For most policies you can go up to about age 75 to get the to get the insurance policy but like any insurance you have to buy it before you need it so that's kind of the the tricky is there a look part. back I mean, is it a day before you need it or is there a look back period you you could purchase it a day before you needed it if you knew but the insurance company will also okay. do a lot of thorough underwriting to make sure that... Oh, like health insurance. Exactly, exactly. So if you have that diagnosis already of Parkinson's or MS, it unfortunately it's, it's too late. Okay. Cost prohibitive, uh, cost-wise, it's best to look, I'd say, 52 to 68-ish. Hey, I can start One looking more next year. year. Mark, that's right. right. You'll hit another milestone. So the, so the, <laughs> the younger you are... Uh, absolutely the most the most affordable but that's why it's always good to sit down with a, um, a professional to really do a, a, some type of plan whether it includes insurance or not but to talk through that <clears throat> when we need long-term care how's this you know what is it that we want how are we going to pay for it and how's it going to affect our children and then your last question was how many people have it percentage-wise only about seven per, seven to eight percent of the American public carry long-term care insurance. When we will start to hear the phone ring is after a child sees this happen, because I'll come up with every reason as why I'm never going to need long-term care. But the fact of the of the matter is, is that there's a one uh, one in two shot that I am. So rather than fighting it, let's plan, and how we're going to pay for it. So very few of the American, American public um, uh, has it, and we're hoping to get that word out. But as the uh, baby boomers, like yourself, are becoming older, uh, it's becoming more common and something to talk about. I was just presuming my kids would take care of me. Well, they will, <laughs> but we just... <laughs> well, Tom, Tom from Gilbert, oh, go ahead. 
I took. I'm just saying. I took care of my kids. It'll be their turn to take care of me. Yes, that's only your natural, kids right? Got better, and they left. Oh, that's true. Yes. Uh, Tom from Gilbert said he's relatively a young man, but he has pre-existing conditions. So is that? That that could that could uh, uh, actually make him unable to to get the insurance. So what what, what kind condition. what kind of preconditioning? Uh, what kind of preconditions? Is that pre-existing how you know? pre-existing conditions? conditions there right. you go. Make it so that you cannot get the insurance at all. Well, one would be um, right now. Fortunately, they don't look at family history yet. So, if you do have the Alzheimer's in your family, you're okay currently. But any type um, of uh, something that's going to be debilitating or going to be progressive, if if that makes sense, like type two diabetes, absolutely insulin dependent. I think even Very if they're taking the pill, flag. it's okay. But the insulin dependent, I know, is one right, and that's only because of the increased um, uh, probability for stroke. Also, they're now tying it into Alzheimer's. Uh, there's a uh, there's a lot to it, but any type of of condition that would affect you physically. And also something that is going to get progressively worse. So if you are, but the obvious, if you already have Parkinson's, if you already have insulin-dependent diabetes, if you already have severe crippling arthritis, right. if you um, already suffer short-term, you know, significant short-term memory loss, but you just haven't gotten a diagnosis <laughs> because you don't remember to go to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> or you forgot the phone number. Yes. <laughs> um, things, things like Things like that, right? Yes. But yes. No, but the kinds of things you would expect don't necessarily rule it out. Like high blood pressure wouldn't rule it out or high cholesterol. Does or it make the premium like higher, that. though? No, most of them are an accept or a reject. Some might be able to do an increased premium. Some carriers do. Uh, but more than likely, it's always an accept or a reject. Hmm. Well, so. you know, I would agree with you. People, baby boomers, whose parents are needing care. Less. And you'll see the baby boomers say, that's going on with my parents. I don't want to do that to my kids. I don't want to be like that, so I'm going to go ahead and take care of it. What can I do? I There's a lot of interest anymore. In fact, years ago, when the insurance just started, we were seeing a lot of people in their 70s take the insurance. Wasn't, right. wasn't there a time when the average age was something like 74? It was, and, and now the average buying age is, I think it's down to 56 now. 56 right, because it's considered old. part of retirement planning. Huh. Absolutely. Because we, you know, baby boomers expect to live a long <clears throat> time. That age group doesn't ever think they're going to get old. They fight <laughs> it more than anything else. So they don't want to be a burden on someone. We had another call. Okay, this is an interesting one here for you, Mark. Oh, it's for me. No, I, it's just an interesting one for <laughs> I was you. Say somebody out there's nuts. <laughs> Les is calling from Minneapolis and wanted to know: Do you insure people out of Arizona? Okay. That's the first question. And second, does criminal record have any bearing on this? Oh, that is interesting. Uh, that, you know, that's an angle that, that it's an interesting angle. Yes and no. When you buy long-term care insurance, it will cover you anywhere within the United States. Most carriers will have very limited benefits if you leave the country. And long-term care does not look at your driving record or criminal um, criminal uh, record right now. So all of you who are incarcerated right now. <laughs> they do look at where you live. That's true. They oh. look at where you live. <laughs> all right. That good was question. A great, that, that was a, was a very question. good that question. That was interesting. Because, it, because it, it has to be that way because, of course, there's so many – he, snowbirds here who live here and then go someplace else and that's a big question that will come up okay if I take it here if I take it there Absolutely, yes. what if my family moves um, and what if I end up not in here or Minneapolis but what if I end up for some odd reason in New Mexico will that still be okay you know right. yeah and they, they when they that. buy it for example where in Michigan is that where he was from Minneapolis Minneapolis uh, you're not licensed in Minneapolis so can you still sell him a policy the financial advisor would need to be licensed, so yes. So if, if um, he called the radio show, Nancy would just be insurance licensed in Minneapolis, and then we could sell it. Okay. So it's wherever they live. Uh, or wherever they are, because the, the, a lot of times the snowbirds from you know the Midwest that we see so much will take it here, but it's still good there. Yes. And so as long as the criminal like record is not against old people, you know, violence against old people, then it doesn't count, right? No, they'd probably still insure them. It's probably only if the criminal record was for defrauding an insurance company. <laughs> oh, they, yeah, right. There you they go. probably have to They do look out for their own, yes. I would imagine. All right, so let's suppose we've got the we've got the 56-year-old. The 56-year-old's gone ahead, and as part of their whole retirement plan, they're going to retire maybe when they're 64 or 5. Um, 
they put that all together. But, you know, people are very suspicious of insurance companies today. Right. How can they be sure they're going to get their money? What do they have to do? Well, it's always in the contract. That is what's going to hold up in, in a court of law, not what your insurance agent tells you or the financial advisor tells you. It's what the contract says. And one of the beauties of a long-term care insurance policy is it's, it's more or less black and white, unlike health insurance, where you could have, you know, there could be a lot of, of different types of, of degrees of coverage. Because there's no pre-existing limitations, right? Right. Once, okay. once the carrier accepts you, as long as you did not defraud or were untruthful on the application, when you are eligible for benefits, you can start to receive your money. So. Okay. And how, what, what does eligible mean? What do they have? What creates eligibility? The carrier looks at, at, at two what we call benefit triggers. One is if you're cognitively impaired or so you... Define cognitively impaired. Would so be dementia, knows. Alzheimer's. So once you're diagnosed with something of that nature, you are then eligible for, to receive benefits. Well, how does a doctor determine that? Is there some type of test that they take? There is. There's a standardized testing that a doctor can give and um, or a specialist can, can provide. Well, if it's a doctor, what's, is it like a standardized memory test that has to deal with who the president is, call those funny questions that we, that we joke about sometimes? Right. No, there, there is a, 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 a word recall test, but I've actually never sat through the entire testing to find that out on, you know, the degrees of the dementia. So that one I'm not quite sure. Was but that another, another call? Yeah, that's, this is another great one. Um, and Pam, um, that's really nice that you came right out with that. Um, Pam from Phoenix says she's a drug user. Okay. Does that eliminate her? I, I mean, I guess that's a, a valid question, Very right? Very valid question. In today's yes, world. It, uh, unfortunately, it would, uh, as it would with your health insurance or any types of I, I really insurance. wanted to send her on well, the any, air to any, talk uh, to Nancy. And, I, so. Any kind of drug? Any if, illegal drug? I think she meant illegal drugs. I'm pretty yes. sure. Well, she wouldn't I know, elaborate on it. Of... I think that is one of the questions um, that, you know, they do. They, I think some of them ask how much you drink. And they do ask how, how much, much you smoke. drink. Right. How much you would drink in a week. Don't some of them ask that? They do because alcoholism increases dementia. What do they do? Take a liver swab? Well, it's usually in your doctor's records who's taken your urine or uh, your blood. Oh, look at so that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. They do, because they do order medical records. So, and they do ask about illegal substance. I knew there was a reason I don't like to drink. So, let's say a person is, is using uh, marijuana illegally. Yes. And yeah. we're not talking about Mark. So. No, no. He's a good Mormon boy. He doesn't <laughs> do that stuff. But how long would they have to be off for example, you know, it's like if they used it in 1977 and didn't inhale, for example, that's certainly not going to. But then, they, then right? they would be fine. But they if they use it yesterday, they're probably not fine. So where's the line? There's no waiting period. It's either a yay or a nay. What if they have well, a yeah, card? What if they have a medical think, marijuana card? I think a lot of them say in the past five years, the past 10 years, I think medical marijuana is still going to come along the lines of any other painkiller. If a person is taking morphine, they won't be eligible. All right, so let's go back to the, okay, so first of all, if it's illegal, because that's a legal drug. So, that's so a is question. morphine. Right, but they're going to go by, as she was saying, something that's continuous. So if a person's using morphine, it means they're in a lot of pain. Yeah, but they wouldn't be eligible. But they're on pain management if they're on morphine because there's very low dosages. So does that still qualify? Because that pain management is usually for an uninsurable condition. Ah, oh, yes, the Mariana, of course. With yeah. the Mariana, with the uh, marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So <laughs> you don't recall offhand then how long back they look. Well, that would probably... Marijuana is probably for cancer treatment. Well, yeah, but let's say somebody's using it illegally. So now we're to the illegal. Somebody's using marijuana illegally, but they stopped five years ago or six years ago or ten years ago. And they're going to be honest? Well, of course they're going to be honest. Oh, well, okay. They would put on the application that they had not used it for five years and be fine. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. How but, could they ever prove that? But if they well, ever... still want to be honest. It goes by the... It goes I mean, by I would want to be honest. It goes by medical It goes records. by medical... Right, because they don't... Whatever's documented. They gotcha. traditionally do not do any kind of blood or urine testing before so, you get the policy, traditionally. So unless it's in the doctor's records, they wouldn't know. Right. It's not, it's not life insurance. You get life insurance and the, they come to mm. the house, they take the blood and the urine. They don't do that with long-term care insurance. They, they check all your medical records with your doctor back, depending on the company, too. Uh, so four, a person could years. be on illegal drugs, literally on meth, and as long as no doctor knows about it, you're okay. I mean, you're well, a liar. They, they need okay. to have substantial. I mean, they, they don't like sketchy medical records either. The medical records need to be fairly current. 
But yeah, isn't that true? I mean, well, and, and if they record. hurt themselves doing an illegal activity or, or committing a felon like life insurance, it won't pay. Okay, so, right. So wow. They, yeah, they, spe they specifically prohibit self-inflicted injuries and any injury that occurs in the commission of a felony. And if you end up with Alzheimer's, I you'll never even that, know you're not getting paid. I remember when that question <laughs> came out, too. They never, I have tell you, Mark, they never used to ask it's this question. It's not funny, I mean. <laughs> they never used to ask the question the about family. the commission of a felony the years ago. Would know, I don't know what happened to bring that up, but they did. They changed it and started to say that. It's an interesting point. Thank you. Anytime, yes. yes. Welcome yes. to my show. Here. Oh, I said Nancy's show, but I don't know why she lets me still be a co-host because the directions I sometimes take the questions. You think but. outside the box. I what can do I indeed. Say? I, I do indeed. I, well, to, to finish the, your uh, question, the other way that you become eligible is if you need assistance with what we call activities of daily living. So think of everything you did this morning. Wait, wait, this is how you become the ineligible? Floor. We, well, we all got in and out of, yes, to become eligible for oh, the eligible policy. For, okay, right. so you, in other words, how do we get to the money? We have this insurance policy. So you've policy. got the policy, and now how do you put in a, yeah. in a claim? How do we right. get to the money right. is the big thing because people take this insurance, not so they have another file in their file drawer. They just want to be able to get to the money when they need it, and they, we want to know how. And one, she go. said if I'm, they I'm, can't pass the I'm standardized memory test and whatever the doctor uses is one way, and now the second way is activities of daily living. So... What do they mean by that, like mopping your floor or vacuuming? Well, I think of it as what we did this morning. You all got in and out of bed, which is transferring. We waited until the morning to use the restroom. We used the restroom on our own. We were able to get a shower, get dressed, and have breakfast. If I need help with two of those, I'm in a car accident, and I have paralysis. I can't get in and out of the bathtub and get dressed for a period that's going to be 90 days or longer, making it long-term care. I need long-term care, and Here that's I how I trigger my thinking through my morning, was I, <laughs> Did you do was those I things able like to get yourself? through all that stuff <laughs> so without help? <laughs> so if I understand it, we've got, we first get up, we've got the, the bathing, the toileting, well, the getting up, the, trans the getting up, and the, okay. The transferring, waiting until the morning to use the restroom. There's, days my, there's days my teenager would qualify. <laughs> <laughs> that's why they've got the 90-day rule. In there, oh, okay. <laughs> 90 more, and that's a federal rule, isn't it? That's not it the is. insurance company's rule. It is. Right. The federal government does have some standardization, so you have to go full Hey, Joe, are you days. inviting people to just be live if they want? They can be live yeah, if they want. Asking everybody. All right, all right. We get all these calls, you notice. I did. And they're timid. So they want to be off air, ask their question, then get, uh, get back Well, some on. I can understand why. So, you know they don't want to ask that, but um, but they, well, so these are the things, the things that we would need to do in the morning, or the things, or we go backwards, the things we would do to help a child. So yes. a child needs help with the bathing, the child needs help with dressing, the child needs help while getting on and off, off the toilet with feeding, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. getting up out of bed, maybe pulling them up out of their mm -hmm. crib, yeah. those kinds of things. Right, right. So and they don't count cleaning, they don't count. No. Vacuuming them up. They count the things that you would need to do to get ready for the, a day. Or conversely, what a child would need to do, what you would need to do to help a child get ready for the day. Right. And what's interesting, just a, a little bit of trivia, is that as you become older, you need assistance with them the opposite way that you learn them as a child. So the last thing that you let your child do on their own is bathing, which is the first thing uh, that you will need assistance with as you get older, which might make some of us happy. I'm so getting my pilot's <laughs> license so that I don't have to go through all that is all I'm saying. Well, and we do hear that. We do yes. hear that quite often. And, and, and that's why I, I pointed out that it is a woman's issue because most of us with our spouses, I mean, you have your caretaker and it's your spouse, but what's this going to do to her and how's this going to affect her? So a lot of times when you're talking about long-term care planning, it's not about yourself. It's about your spouse and it's about your kids because that's who the insurance is for because they're not going to let you go. They're well, not going to let you jump off and all that. They, well, I see two parts of that. Right. I have met women whose health was shattered by the time they finished taking care of husbands. Right. Right. And that's not an uncommon thing. And I'm sure there's families out there who can attest to that. You got another call. Can, can no, that was my wife calling to see what I wanted for dinner. <laughs> From Quiznos. <laughs> Sorry. There's a plug for Quiznos. Do they advertise for you? <laughs> they don't. You need a business coach. Oh. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> don't pay tonight, Marie. <laughs> Ask for of, for free. Um, what kind of premiums can a person expect? Let's say it's a 51-year-old, handsome, healthy guy like me. Well, the handsome probably doesn't do anything but healthy. Have the, they don't take pictures. And I, well, I'm a healthy guy. Yes, health is count. Yeah. No pictures. No pictures. No. Probably around eighty to a hundred dollars a month. So, so not that's not 
bank breaking right there. No, and and they're so customizable that you know we could get it down to a fifty dollar a month premium all the way up to five hundred dollar. So let's say some of these really unhealthy. Let's throw in type two diabetes pills though. Pills. Okay. Well, you can't get it if you got type two. Yes, yeah, you can. Type two diabetes with pills. With pills. Mm-hmm. Does that double? You think? Some some carriers will increase your premiums anywhere from twenty five to fifty percent. But most of them will either say yes or no. Oh yeah, you said that. Are you earlier. talking about per year? No, no, per, per month. Does, I yes. mean, does it does it actually continue to get more expensive every year? Oh, yeah. that's a good question. You no, know, it would jump up, and that's what your premium would be. So, oh, in other okay. words, if I if I let's say I locked in and I'm at uh, seventy five bucks a month, just to okay. pick a number, is it that for the rest of my life? No, it could change. It could go up. It's priced to stay at seventy five dollars a month. But like with any other type of insurance, if they have adverse claims, they can come in and do a rate increase. But you also have the ability to change your benefits that if you say, no, that rate increase is too much. I don't want to pay $100 a month now. I don't want the bath. But I could uh, lower my benefits and then keep it at the 75 I think what Mark means is will it go up because he gets older. So he takes it at oh. 51 or 52, but he turns 60. Will they automatically put in a rate increase no. as he gets older? Yeah, like term life insurance. You buy a 20-year oh, right. policy and the 21st year. A uh, hundred dollar policy is now twelve hundred bucks. Right. Or, no. or will it? What if you put in a claim? Then does your premium go up? What happens if if, if you can you, put in claims before you need the long term care? No, no. What if you need the long term care and you put in a claim? Are they going to raise your rates there? What happens you still to, when you put in the after. claim? No. What happens when you put in a claim? When you put in the claim, your premium is waived. Oh, so, it's waived. So you don't that continue to that. pay it. But when you come off of claim, which is happening quite often, your premium would go back to what it originally was. So it's not, okay. So, no. so long term care. I mean, this is coming from somebody who has no idea what the, what we're talking about. Just learned here. So the long term care is if Mark fell down and broke his hip, he would get taken care of. But then he would be on his own again. We're not talking about him going to a nursing home. Right. So while he's doing the long term care, he's getting paid. And then he goes back to paying when he gets out. When he gets out. Um, <laughs> when I'm on parole. So, so that's how it's used? He breaks an arm. He can get the long-term care. So, maybe. Maybe, but it always has to be a long-term condition, so 90 days or longer. So if he breaks that arm ah. and gets infected and you're and you're really in and you're not able to 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 bathe and get dressed and or you have a stroke i mean that, that's uh, people can have a stroke and be eight nine ten months twelve months a year and have to recover absolutely. from the stroke and and they, that's when they come in and raise your rates because they're like chances no, are they, you're gonna have another no, one she, she they just don't. said they don't raise your rates because if of you have health, claims be, though no they don't no, raise your rates. Not, really no. wow not because of health or because you get older neither one Gotcha. So, so if you have, if you somebody took their policy and they were sixty five and they're eighty today, and and generally speaking, their rates will have gone up because rates just go up in you know over a twenty year period. But because I've looked at people's policies, you can't at age eighty get them anything remotely close to what they're currently paying because they're always going to pay whatever a sixty five year old is paying, even if the rates go up. I'm so checking into this right? for me and my wife. Seriously. Oh yeah, people can take it when they're. I would not want to. I would not want to go into a home. You wouldn't want to no go way. to a home? No way. They have bingo and stuff there. Well, I mean, they have I, maybe movies. to visit to, oh. for bingo. <laughs> movie <laughs> nights. They bring in entertainment. That kind of stuff scares me. Do they have karaoke? But here's, here's the they deal, don't, too. I have not seen karaoke. I do have to tell you that. <laughs> to, get, to get the government benefits, which would be another topic if you want to get uh, me on my horse, yes. but to get that, because I'm not a big fan of that, just so mm-hmm. you know. But one of the characteristics is that a person has to spend down yes. everything. Which is what happens more often than not is that somebody didn't, t- didn't plan for when they needed long-term care because they were never going to need it or whatever their reason was. What does that mean, spend down? Okay, so, let me, so in other words, if I want to get government benefits like Medicare, I, I can't have $100,000 in the bank and get that benefit. You've got to use that up sure. for your medical costs first. And you can't just transfer it to somebody either or hold this till I get better type thing. But I think with, your, with, with, a, with a long-term care policy, they, they ignore that, right? I can be a millionaire billionaire and have long-term care coverage right what, or tr- no yet yes and no because oh yes you're, and you're, no i love those that she's an attorney now <laughs> she's like me um the, the your depends. insurance policy would pay first and then when you started then if the uh, insurance policy expired maybe it was a three-year plan you have alzheimer's we're going on our fourth year of needing care you then would start to pay out of pocket and you would mm. have to start to spend down your assets before Anybody would come in and pick up those costs. So the long-term care policy expires. In some way? I'm not understanding that. Yeah, there's different ways that you can you can design these policies, and you design it on how much do you want it to pay, for how long, 
and how soon? Kind of like life insurance. You know, the more life insurance you buy, the more the premium, so you can buy a million-dollar life insurance. Same thing with long-term care. You can buy, you're buying a pool of money. You can buy a $200,000 pool of money or a $500,000 pool of money or 750000 or unlimited. I have a lady that is on claim right now that just started as an unlimited pool of money. Good thing because she's got senility and so forth. Right, so for an unlimited one, right, the you premium never will would probably run out be a lot money. more than 75 bucks. Yes, yes, it would be. That would be close to that $500 you were talking about. No, it would something. probably be more about 130 150 All right, so let's just say 150 to be on. So 150 then I get some kind of benefit that would last me forever. So I can be as wealthy as I want to be, and if something happens to me, that long-term care kicks in. Yes, it's 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 health insurance. Okay, but it's it's also then then these other. See, I'm learning too. And by the way, I used to be licensed, which is very pathetic that I've forgotten all this stuff. I I used to be tested on this <clears> back <throat> in the day. The, it's uh, changed a lot since then, though. Oh, has it as well? Bad, yeah. Yeah, because this is uh, this is not what I remember. There's also policies that pay a percentage of my salary, right? That would be disability. That's disability. Right. So disability makes up a portion of your salary, but it doesn't pay all those additional medical expenses. But I can get both of those, right? Yes, absolutely. Joe, get another, did we I, get another caller with your we, wife again? We did, and I, I apologize if I say the name wrong. I believe it was Prince. Um, sounded like an older lady. Wanted to know if she would be forced to do a reverse mortgage because she has a lot of equity in her home. Good question. Depends what state... Now, with Arizona, you can have up to $500,000 in equity in well, your home. Are we talking about long-term care or are we talking about Medicare? She's asking a state, how the state rules for, for it. Medicaid. Oh, for Medicaid. Yeah, for Medicaid. All right, so for Medicaid. Because long-term care doesn't matter, right? Right, no. it doesn't matter. You know, all the equity you want for long-term care. And, and some, there are some avenues or ways of funding long-term care, just, just true care, by doing a reverse mortgage. But you wouldn't be forced into it. She would have to just pay out of pocket and then could look at that as an avenue. But in order for the state to come in and, p and pick up the expenses because she's run out of money, which happens more often than or not, the most equity she can have in her, her home in Arizona is 500000 For the state to pay. But the, the oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so if, if a person is going to get a Medicaid benefit in Arizona, they can have $499,000 of equity in their home and they're okay. Yes. All right. Very good. But if there's five twenty-seven, you have to spend twenty-eight. Perfect. Mm -hmm. See Perfect. What, good question. Just trying to prove my math One skills. One of the things <laughs> I want to add, if I might, is you know Susan mentioned that the coverage is really good to protect the family. But with your talking about protecting money, an, ex an analogy I've used for years is that is that we all have our our nest eggs. And an example, I just hope it doesn't offend anybody, but I will tell my people, you have a nest egg, but unbeknownst to you, you have the equivalent of an aneurysm on your nest egg. And they usually look at me very puzzled and say, what are you Kinda talking like I'm about? Kind of like right now? Yes, they, exactly like you're doing right now. You're perfect. <laughs> and, they, and I say, well, you are the aneurysm. You see, your nest egg would be perfectly fine if you were to stay perfectly healthy. But the minute you start to need care, your nest egg is going to start to bleed. Now, what happens when you get an aneurysm? You know, you'd bleed to death fairly quickly. You, you need long-term care. Your nest egg starts mm -hmm. to pay. The kind of number Susan was describing is going to bleed to death, isn't it? And so a second protection that the long-term care offers is it does protect the nest egg. So that's why it doesn't matter how much money you have because the long-term care is bought to protect the nest egg. It's not going to take an individual and make them well. It's not going to take an individual and make them sick. It's not like they get a long-term care policy and it emits mysterious fumes and all of a sudden you have a stroke. Nothing like that. It's designed to provide money and, in a sense, bandage that aneurysm that's on your nest egg so the nest egg stays intact, which is why Susan and we find other adult children paying for their parents' policies because by adult children paying their parents' policies, what are they doing? They're not keeping their parents healthy. They are they? I'm They're making my kids. sure the nest egg, <laughs> their inheritance, will stay healthy. I can't wait to. Get I home can't today. imagine that they all think that I'm gonna way. I'm going to sit down with. Nathan. Oh, a lot of them. It's, it's, it, you have to. I, take I, the, have, you I have, have a hard to, time believing that. You have to realize that it's not. Again, this is money and motivation. If parents need care, then why would? the parents' money or the kids' money be used to pay for the care when there's a perfectly good insurance company to pay the money for pennies on the dollar. It's just a very sensible part of planning. We have life insurance. People buy life insurance to pay estate taxes, right, Mark? Uh, they do, do at they times. Not? They do yes, times. they do. They buy, they buy life insurance. They can pass wealth down to children on a tax-free basis. I mean, I would this think... This is no different. I would think from, you know, from, from my state 
I would think I would buy long-term care for my parents so I could provide them with professional care when needed. That's two, that's two right? parts to it. I mean, they could spend the, all their money. Right. You've got the emotional part that you want to make sure the parents have care, which is what Susan was talking about. But then you have the other three siblings who don't have that kind of a heart in them. And so you're having the primary caregiver here say, okay. They're bums. Children. <laughs> Brothers and Who? sisters. The other three we're, siblings. The other three siblings. The main we're ones. making sure that mom or dad gets really good care. We're not using estate assets to do this. And so you, you do both things. There's two sides to it. There's always the family emotional side. And, of course, you know, kids like you or like Susan, you know, want the parents to have everything, say, go spend your money. However, it makes sense not to spend money foolishly. And so instead of going and putting yourself at risk for spending three or $400,000 for long-term care, pay your 100 bucks a month, get your, you know, your kit, get it covered, mm. and then you're not using your own money, and you're still getting wonderful care. Can you then decide with the, with the policy, you can pick the home, you can say, okay, I yes. want to go with this one. Is there a cap on the monthly amount? Because my, my mother was taking care of my, my aunt or her aunt or anyway – she was she passed away at 98 okay. but she took care of her for 10 years and it got into her personal money boy and it went quick it does she went from quick. being very wealthy down to like 50 grand when she i mean she was right at the end so it it really blew quick but they put her in one of those it was like four thousand a month for that's you know a, a that's home about with, right that's about right with 10 people oh, it was a nice crazy. place but that, that's what the policies provide is choice because you have the money I'm going to have this amount of money every month, $4,000. I can choose where it is that I want to go. If the costs are over and above that, I would make up the difference, so kind of like a co-insurance. But you have the money to be able to make a choice, which is perfect. But it's not a ideal. reimbursement policy, meaning if you, if you die, there's no premiums that are reimbursed to family. Or anything. It's, no, it's, it's, so that's how they can afford it as an insurance company. They're counting on mm -hmm. statistically a certain amount of people will die before they need it. Right. And that's why you need a professional to figure out inflation right so you figure out how much about you got to calculate when people are going to die guess or what well is what that about how it inflation works? susan why don't you explain how that works inflation is a very important component because of the way that they're saying these costs are going to triple in the mm -hmm. next 20 years but you also have to take into consideration affordability what the individual can can afford so we kind of take a look at uh here's what the cost is the average cost is today this you know here here's our starting point do you want to insure 100% of that cost, maybe just half of it, 80%? What is it that you want your insurance to do? Then we take it as to what cost could be, whether or not we want to add uh, some type of inflation benefit to the policies. But they are. They're like puzzles, and that's why it's so important to sit down with somebody. By because way, you do. You determine ahead of time, but you can have the policy increase in value. So let's suppose that... You know, Mark takes his policy and it's unlimited and it's going to go ahead and pay out $4,000 a month, which is good for today, but then it could also increase each each month by, say, 5%. So next month it's worth 5% more than it was this, you know, th this year next year. And that way you keep pace with, inf with inflation also. You can create policies that have these, this built into it. They're, they're very flexible, aren't they? Can't they you are pretty extremely much do what you flexible, want? absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Am I the only one watching the clock? No, I looked. All right. We have a couple Only of minutes left. So did anything else you w wanted to ask Susan in our last couple of minutes? I think this has been incredibly informing. I, you know, to me, I just, I just hope that it, it has individuals think because it's something that we don't want to think about, but we absolutely have to because it's our spouses and it's our family that's going to suffer. It's a horrendous thought. And, it really is. Well, and, think about your dad, Joe. The last thing you want to think about is your dad, you know, having something happen where he would mm -hmm. be infirm. Right. It's a terrible thought. And oh it's not God. always, you know, to, to, to the degree that we think of. It could be something um, that's very palatable, very easy to, to anticipate that's going to happen. But just like with life insurance, we buy it for our family. And that's why it's so important to sit down and come up with a plan. It might not include insurance, but you just need to talk through it what your wishes are, and, and how you plan on paying it. We plan out death. We know that's going to happen, and so it's just this is just the step before death. Or it could be temporary, like, you know, having it happen and getting better. But even Mayo Clinic talks about the, quote, final chapter. And the final chapter okay. is going to be that, you know, those last older years. Okay. You better make sure people know how to get a hold of you. 
Uh, well, you can absolutely actually reach me through through um, Nancy's oh, yeah, office. You can call here, yes, please. It, and that's four eight zero six three two eight seven seven zero. Oh, Joe, I need to put a plug for my workshops. Absolutely. I oh. forgot. I am doing two workshops out in um, Santan. Well, actually, out in South Gilbert at Trilogy. At the you know where the Trilogy Golf Resort is. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it'll be Wednesday night at six and Thursday night at six. We're having dinner. And we're going to talk about. Several different things like so, best ways to get your Social Security and IRAs. I've got a lot of people calling asking me about annuities. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about planners. We've had some stuff in the paper and AARP and what their motives are on the kinds of things that they're saying. You know, there's always somebody out there trashing somebody. So yes. what's the truth and what's the myth and all of that? But it's, again, either Wednesday or Thursday at 6 o'clock with dinner and dessert. And again, that is four eight zero six three two eight seven seven zero. And we're going to try to get these events and everything on the website. So when you get those sent over to me, we'll get them right on the web, so people can start getting used okay. to going to that page and finding out where you're going to be. That sounds great. That sounds great. We should do a show on AARP and comparing some of those others. I think that is a great idea because mm-hmm. there's a lot. Of not there's. A, I don't happen to like AARP's political stand. I have it from I, I many won't. years ago. Many years ago, when so many people went to AARP, and I would talk to people, say, "Are you aware of what they're promoting?" Yeah, I absolutely am against AARP. They're very self-serving. They're more of a marketing organization. Yes. And uh, years, I can't even remember what was happening. And AARP was promoting the opposite of what my clients were thinking. So that's a good idea. There you go. Really good idea. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate everybody joining us tonight. This is an essential topic. It is one of the least favorite topics that anybody out there has. But I appreciate Susan Carlson joining us and sharing with us her information. Her wealth of information and experience, and Mark is always thinking outside the box. Yep. Next week we'll be talking about a a subject even worse: uh, getting your colon checked. So come back next week. (laughs) Can't wait. (laughs) That's going to be amazing. And of course, Joe. And uh, we don't want you to have uh, scary thoughts about your dad, just because we talk about this again. This is a topic that it's, it's hard. We want people to think about it for just a little bit, get it handled, and then go on with their life. But not have it nagging. All right. Join us again next week. God bless. Are you experiencing computer problems? Is your computer running slow, bogged down with viruses and spyware? You need a reliable and knowledgeable, trustworthy computer service company. Contact Computers, Networks, and More, located in Santan Valley. Get your computer or laptop running in top condition by a certified technician with 20-plus years experience and beta tester from Microsoft. Computers, Networks, and More provides repairs and solutions to any computer-related issue, whether it's software, installation, Installation, troubleshooting, updates, or tune-ups. You can trust computers, networks, and more. Contact Jeff Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 7 p.m. to schedule an appointment. We can have you up and running quickly, usually within 48 hours. Located in Santan Valley. Computers, networks, and more. We're here for you. Contact Jeff at 480-729-8899. That's 480-729-8899. you feel like you keep talking and no one cares? Well, Brian Martin does. Every Thursday from 6 to 8 on KQCK Live. Politics, world leaders, who's good, who's bad, he'll be there to talk with you. Brian Martin on KQCK Live. Every Thursday from 6 to 8.